Spread the fire. This is another episode of SMWX. I'm Tessa Dooms. Um, and today we're going to be talking all things manifestos. Not everyone's manifesto, but um, I wanted us to have a little conversation about manifestos. How do we engage them and do they matter in this election? Let's get into it. Na, 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 na. So every election, um, we have these big parties with big rallies, and the biggest rally or the most important rally um, is the manifesto rally, because that's the first time within the election year that most parties gather people around um, to talk about what their offering is for the election. Um, and we've seen in this election cycle already a number of political parties have started to have their manifesto launches, um, some big, some small, some in the Moses Mabida Stadium, many in the Modus, Moses Mabida Stadium, um, and some in you know halls um, in different parts of the country. But what is the point of a manifesto um, in an election? So a few years ago, I used to work for an organization called Youth Lab. And we did an interesting thing where we went around the country and spoke to young people about manifestos um, as we created something that Youth Lab does um, still to this day, which is a manifesto for youth, um, a youth so the, the South African Youth Manifesto. But one of the things we asked young people that year, I think it was um, 2018, um, just before the 2019 election, was whether they had read manifestos. And what we found shocking is not only um, was there kind of, many people who had never read a manifesto before, but there was also confusion about what a manifesto is. So a lot of people who said they'd read a manifesto believed that a manifesto was a pamphlet or a poster of a political party because the time that they interact most with political parties, they're getting, um, they're getting pamphlets from those political parties or they're seeing posters and T-shirts. Um, and that always stays with me because I realize that when we say, you know, what is a party's manifesto, we take for granted that the country all has the same understanding of a manifesto. And one of the things that it also taught me is that we have a bad manifesto culture in this country. So a manifesto is meant, you know, the world over and historically all the time to be a political party or a political group's offering um, their worldview, the way they see society and what it is they believe they bring to society in terms of change going forward. And our manifesto culture has been particularly poor in South Africa, and I'll, I'll tell you why I think that is. I think firstly, um, political parties have ignored manifestos in the main. So when I say that, I know that the big parties, particularly the ANC and the DA, who we'll be talking about today, the EFF, have had manifestos that they've put out and they've launched. But many of the other parties, um, and as we all know, we have over 300 parties in this country, have not taken seriously putting out manifestos, have not taken seriously putting out um, a real statement of intent from one election cycle to the next. Um, I remember a few years ago, one party that's actually quite prominent in parliament, well, I'm not going to mention because this is a bit shady, um, put out a letter from the leader of the party as the manifesto, a one-page letter. That was it. For the next five years, it was, dear voter, this is what we're going to do for you in one page. Um, love your leader. And I think that we don't have a strong culture of manifestos because we don't know as the electorate what to do with manifestos as well. And so the parties have tested out different methodologies. You have a party like the EFF. Uh, part of the reason I'm not reviewing them today is because it's 260 pages of a manifesto. And so you need to wade through those 200 pages. But that's also not a necessarily a useful way to write a manifesto when you're trying to communicate to 40 million voters, or in our case, the voters are all, I guess, is 27 and a half million people. So you're trying to communicate to such a large group of people, many people are not going to read 260 pages. Um, I mean, most people even in who are writing PhDs and books are not reading 200 plus pages very often. So who is that written for? Who is a manifesto of 200 odd pages written for? Can everybody read it? Can everybody engage it? Can everybody understand what it is that the offering is um, in simple enough um, ways and language that it connects with people's personal lives, their personal experience, and their personal choice? 
But on the other hand, the other extreme is just putting out a letter, putting out a 10 point bullet plan, just, you know, bullet points and just talking points. And that's also not sufficient. But maybe one of the biggest indicators that we've got a bad manifesto culture in this country is that every party's manifesto has been written in English in this country in the past 30 years. This is in a country that has 12 official um, languages, if you include sign language, which we should now. Um, and so who are we communicating to when the documents are long? Who are we communicating to when the documents are short? But who are we communicating to when the documents are English, um, when the majority of the country really speaks different languages when they talk about um, things that are personal to them? And again, the political is deeply, deeply personal. And so I would like to encourage and, and provoke political parties in this segment to really think about how you're communicating your manifesto this year, what a manifesto represents. I'll tell you what my perfect manifesto is, and, and I'll weigh in on what I think um, the ANC and the DA get right or wrong in what I think a manifesto should have. I think, firstly, a manifesto has to have a set of guiding principles or guiding ideas, ideology. You know, we might call it an ideology on another day, but there must be some values or a set of guiding principles as to what you care about in a society, what kind of society you believe we should have and what kind of values that society should have. I think that broadly helps anybody to understand that this party cares about inequality or this party cares about the lives of this group of people and that group of people. This party cares about a society that is safe. This, this party cares about particular things. And so besides the priorities that the party you know, will get into into detail, you have to get a sense of what vision of the future of the country um, a party has and what kind of values drive that. So even if they don't address every single topic in their manifesto, they're not exhaustive in the way the EFF does um, try to be, you can still imagine when it comes to the issues you care about where you think they may land on an issue because you understand their overall vision for what they think the country should be. The second thing that I think a good manifesto is, is deeply based on the experiences and, and a relatable sense in the country. There's one thing about doing research, and research is absolutely important for understanding you know, what the issues in the country are, what matters, um, looking at research that comes from other countries and trying to do comparisons between different countries to see what has worked in other countries is really, really important. But I also think that a manifesto, uh, and a good manifesto, bases itself on experiences of people and thinks about that research as very living and very contemporary. So sometimes, you know, the focus is, especially if you think about something like the economy, um, people are looking at what the economists are saying. I would encourage political parties to not only ask what the economists are saying, what the big research from the big academic institutions are, but what's the research from communities? What's the research from different groups of people? What are people saying is important to them? That's what I think is important in a manifesto, that it doesn't only draw on research in kind of big ways, but it also tries to take the temperature of the country in the moment in which that manifesto is coming out. Because ultimately, when we think about a manifesto and when we read a manifesto, we are reading it in the current period. We are reading it as voters that are having experiences now that we care about. And how that translates you know, in comparison to China or in comparison to Scandinavia or in comparison to Rwanda is a secondary thing to how it relates to my life. And so it must be um, based on the experiences of people to be relatable. And that is the third point um, I want to make, and it goes back to the question of what kind of document that you produce. Um, I think the kind of document that you want to produce is one that's incredibly relatable, where people can see themselves in that manifesto and they can grapple with the issues for themselves. They don't have to agree with everything in your manifesto, but they must be able to relate to the manifesto. We as the voters are reading to see ourselves in that document, not just to see the party. But I think the final thing that I'll reflect on in terms of what makes for um, a particularly good manifesto is one that hits a balance between um, big promises and plans. 
So um, I used to be on the National Planning Commission of South Africa. And we, we well, I, well, my predecessors, I was in the second commission, wrote the National Development Plan um, as a vision for South Africa. So it was a bit of a contradiction in terms. We were calling it a plan, but in fact it was more of a vision because a plan has not only goals and ideas in it, but it also has targets and timelines and deliverables. And I think a good manifesto in this country particularly has to have a good mix of both of those things. Yes, we need to know what the promises are, but in a time like ours now in South Africa, People want to know that things can be done and when they will be done. You know, is there a timeline? And as we talk particularly about um, the ANC's manifesto, especially for parties that have been in governance, that have had the opportunity to do it, what makes a voter know that you're actually going to do it this time? Um, how do they know to keep you accountable and to know that when you are delivering or when you are not delivering by your own statement? Um, I'm going to end off the segment by saying that for me, a manifesto is almost like a proposal um, in, in the way a marriage or a love proposal might be. You need to tell a partner what it is you bring to the table and what it is you commit to. That's what we can hold other people accountable to. We can have expectations and we must have expectations, but ultimately what people commit to, what they say they are going to do, and how much they're willing to put their head on the block, that's what we best can hold them accountable to. And so I think we, we must have a culture of manifestos where we have vision and goals and we have promises that, that are made, but I also think we need to move quite swiftly to a point where people are saying, it's this, by this time, for this reason, and if I don't do it, these should be the consequences. So in today's session, um, I want to talk about the ANC and the DA um, as two parties I want to compare in terms of their manifestos. Um, yes, I know a lot of people are waiting for a breakdown of an EFF manifesto. I, I've seen a few floating around the internet, um, but I've decided to, to focus on the DA and the ANC for two reasons. One is that historically they've been the longest parties that have been rivals at the top. Um, the DA, of course, much lower than the ANC in percentage of votes, but they've been rivals for long enough. But also because, particularly when it comes to the DA, the DA has run elections on the basis of its claim that it's very different from the ANC. And as I've read manifestos over the years, it's actually been hard to distinguish in some cases the ANC from the DA in some of its policies. Um, and so I wanted to look at that because the DA's claims around how different it is from the ANC is reflected sometimes in the difference in the constituencies, but is it reflected in the difference in the kind of South Africa that these two parties see? Um, as we go through this, I also want to talk a little bit about how I read manifestos and how I suggest that we go into this election reading manifestos. Um, my ethos for this election is that as voters, we have to get involved and we need to get proactively involved and do the work. We have to do our part and not just show up on election day, not just wait for the political parties to come to us. Um, voting is an exercise of hiring and firing. And so we need to do interviews. Before voting day, we have to interview political parties to see who we want to hire and who we want to fire. And so my approach to, to doing a manifesto um, analysis is to start with myself rather than to start with the manifestos. And I think as communities of people, we definitely need to start by asking ourselves, what do we want? What are the issues that are on the ballot for us? What are the things that we want to vote for or what do we want to vote against? Before the political party comes and makes its, pro its promises and its proposals, we need our own checklist of the things that matter to us. Again, I'll make the comparison with a love relationship or somebody proposing marriage. You don't kind of just wait for people to come and propose marriage and then decide what you like. Most people decide, okay, here's my list of the things that I want in a partner. And then as people approach you, you're able to have a yardstick about what works for you and what doesn't. I think we need to have a similar approach um, in this election, decide for ourselves what matters to us. And so for me in this election, I've decided to you know, think about a few issues that I particularly care about. And they're not necessarily the issues that are top on the agenda of the ANC or the DA, but I'll let you know how they stack up. So the first issue that I want to look at 
is what I call keeping the nation alive and well. My issue on the ballot is which parties are focused on and have a plan for uh, and a vision for keeping us alive and well um, in a way that matters. So what do I mean by that? I've always believed that the role of any government, every government on the planet, at a basic level is to keep us alive as people and to make sure that we are well, to make sure that we are healthy. And that focuses on things like our basic needs, our basic human rights. So it's food, health, shelter, um, the things without which we cannot live or we cannot breathe. So how do these two parties, the ANC and the DA, tackle this issue of keeping us alive and well? Well, I would actually say I was quite surprised looking at these two, how similar their approaches are to this in the main. So in both of the manifestos, in the ANC's manifesto and the DA's manifesto, there is a strong focus actually on social protection and a social protection net and an investment in social protection. Um, and these things cover things like grants. So historically, the ANC has made a very big deal about its ability to roll out the child, the child protection grant, um, the disability grant, the old age grant, and more recently, the 350 um, grant. And it's really spoken a lot about the ways in which this has kept people out of absolute poverty. And the DA hasn't been as vocal about grants in the past. In this particular manifesto, the DA is quite strong about grants. So both of these parties make a claim that they will pursue grants, social grants, and make sure that particularly something like the child protection grant and the, the child support grant, um, apologies, is um, increased, it's strengthened, it's continued, and then make a particular point, both of these parties again, about the social distress of relief grant, the, the 350 grant. Surprisingly, both parties say the grant must be kept, but on the ANC side, it says it must be then considered to be converted into a basic income grant. Now, basic income grant, by every standard that we've seen in terms of research that's out there, should be a higher grant. So a basic income grant is a grant for anybody who's between the ages of 18 and the age of about 60, who is of working age, um, that is able to get a grant that can help them with either food or shelter or work. People could use it for anything. And the numbers that have been floating around, both in the ANC's um, preparatory documents, in the National Planning Commission's work, um, and the work of some NGOs, is maybe having a figure of about 1,500 rand. I think the ANC goes, falls a little bit short in committing to it. So it says, we will think about extending to a basic income grant. And I think it's because that number of 1,500 would be a big number to commit to when the ANC government is saying that there's a fiscal crisis crisis and we don't have enough money. But it is toying with the idea of a basic income grant and it is saying that there's a possibility to extend it. What's also interesting about that tentativeness about saying we'll have a basic income grant is that it doesn't give any time frame for that. So it doesn't say within this five years, we will make that conversion, which means by the end of the five years, if the ANC hasn't committed to a basic income grant, it can say, well, we just said we will try and move it in that direction. So we could end up after five years without a basic income grant if we choose the ANC, and it could still get away with not being accountable. So remember when I said a plan that has goals and timelines, this is an example of why one is important. But the DA is interesting because I definitely did not expect the DA to lean into the 350 grant. Um, so it speaks about the 350 grant, increasing that grant, but also converting it into a job seekers grant. Now, the difference between these two is that the basic income grant that the ANC is talking about, and even the 350 grant right now, is not one that um, is specific to a particular group of people like job seekers. It's not conditional. But the, the, the DA is asking for a conditional grant for only people who are job seekers. And so there are a variety of ways that that could take place. They don't get into the details about what the conditionalities would be. But they're basically saying we're not just going to give people the money and give everybody the money. Universal basic income means it's universal, whether you're working, whether you're not, all of that. We're going to give it to unemployed people based on the condition that they are job seekers. How they would work that out, they haven't spelt out. 
But I do think it's important to note that both of these parties are committing to grants. Um, I think it's it's one of those things that um, as people talk, you know, in general terms about the DA is definitely not an expected thing, but it's a very strong part of the offering that they're putting on the table. The other part of being alive and well are, are things like health. Um, and especially when it comes to the healthcare system and how well-being is treated, both of these parties have um, a strong focus on health care, but not on well-being and keeping you healthy. And that's one of the things I always look out for. How much of what you're saying keeps me healthy versus deals with my health afterwards? Um, if you think about it in terms of the cost to the country, I always think that it must be less expensive to make sure people never need a healthcare system than to try and service everybody who gets ill because you haven't been keeping people well. That being said, they have different approaches to this. The ANC is leaning in to the national health insurance, the idea of a universal, universal access to healthcare and making sure that people get the highest quality healthcare regardless of their payment status. Um, the DA has traditionally and continues to say that they disagree with the national health insurance um, and they don't think that it will work. What both of the, the, the plans have in common, and this is where the DA's proposal comes up, is both are requiring some sort of mix between the public healthcare sector and the private healthcare sector. When it comes to the NHI, the ANC uh, is saying that we want an NHI and we want a healthcare system where both private and public are more accessible to everybody and where this cross subsidy of the two um, into each other. Um, importantly for the NHI to work, and I think the ANC doesn't actually stress this enough, is that you need a strong public healthcare system. In other parts of the world, like the UK, where there is an NHI, um, that NHI works through the public system in the main. When you go to the private system, you're really opting out of the main system, but your insurance is for public services in the main. The DA goes a completely different route with this in their focus on the private healthcare system. And I was a bit astounded by it. Um, the DA does such a good job of breaking down what all the issues are in private insurance and private healthcare because they're trying to increase the number of people who are able to access private healthcare with very little talk about the public system. And so I, I keep wondering as I was reading the document why there's no mention of a public healthcare system from a government who is the public healthcare. And again, this is a fundamental difference. This is a difference in terms of how you see society. And this is where the DA shows that it doesn't have a strong commitment to the government as the center of society in delivering the things I think are basic, right? At a basic level, being alive and well, a government should care that you eat, care where you sleep, and care that you're healthy and well. And here the DA is demonstrating that it is willing to, and even committed to, outsourcing that function to somebody else in society. I think it's different approaches. The one is a mix of private, but the other leans into private a lot more. You have to decide which one is best for you. But I would say that we need to think about why it is that the private sector is such a focus for the DA. Um, at least that's the question that I'm asking when they're saying what we want to do is govern society. So the next part of keeping us alive and well is food. Um, what are we going to eat? We have a growing crisis of hunger in the country, a growing crisis of malnutrition. So um, people who work in the space of um, food security, people who work in hospitals, will tell you that five, 10 years ago, you'd be talking about malnutrition and hunger when it comes to children in South Africa. Increasingly, we're seeing hunger and malnutrition amongst adults. And that's on top of the fact that we do have a crisis around the cost of living and people's access to food. Now, again, the ANC and the DA have um, very similar approaches to this. And again, some surprises on the DA side, at least for me. From the ANC side, um, they anchor their question around food on the cost of living and the cost of food. And so their big solutions really are derived from making sure that they zero rate more products. So there are a list of products where we don't have to pay um, VAT on them right now. They increase those um, that basket of goods. 
And that's really the thing they speak about the most. The DA um, takes the same kind of position around zero rating more foods, but where the DA is um, a bit more interesting here is they also speak about things like small smallholder farming and subsistence farming and something they call food hubs, which they don't explain in much detail. But there's certainly a bit more of a producer side to the equation of food. Um, so the ANC does say they're committed to food security, but don't actually say how food security would work out. What are they going to focus on? Are they going to focus on ag the agriculture sector? Are they going to focus on small holdings? And um, they don't really address how food security will come about. Whereas the DA speaks about with a little bit more detail um, about the idea of smallholder subsistence farming and food hubs. I thought that was a really interesting um, addition. But both of these things, I think, speak to a very contemporary issue around food and food security and hunger and malnutrition. And definitely, I think both parties deserve props for making sure that it's in there. Whether they've gone far enough, I would say probably not. I think that there is a major question that is outstanding in both um, around the, the industry, the food industry. So it's farming and our ability to manufacture our own food. This has implications not only for the sector around land distribution, not only around the agriculture sector, not only around opening up that sector to more people, but it also has implications for foreign policy. Whether we're going to be importing more food, whether we're going to be exporting our best foods, um, all of those things are not addressed, I think, in adequate detail. And I think at the end of the day, if we're going to resolve food insecurity, those bigger questions are going to be where the answers lie more than the initiatives to stop the gaps once food is available. We do need a food security plan that says, where does our food come from and who's able to access it before we talk about the price at which it's going to be sold. And then I think the last thing that goes into the live and well, which I think is a huge crisis in South Africa that we're not talking about, is housing. The last time we had a comprehensive social housing plan in South Africa was literally 1996. When the RDP was rolled out for the first time, that was a social housing plan that looked at the whole country and said, housing is a need, we need low cost housing, we need to be able to deliver this many houses. The ANC at its manifesto launch spoke about 4.7 million houses that it's built, but it speaks about that over the entirety of the 30 year period it's governed. There are not housing targets in either of these manifestos, the ANC or the DA. There's not a strong focus on the question of informal housing, even though we know that Stats South Africa has let us know that 1.5 million households in this country live in informal settlements live in shack dwellings. And on average, you have four members per house. Let's just say that's, that's our average, and that's what Stats South Africa calls an average household. If we just go with the average, you are looking at six million people in this country who are living in shack dwellings. That doesn't include people who are living in huts. That doesn't include people who are living in dilapidated apartments or dilapidated buildings in the inner cities of Joburg. That doesn't include people who are living in back rooms. It just includes people who are living in informal shelter. I think we have a huge housing crisis in this country, and I think it is at the, the core of many of the economic issues we also face. Because if young people don't have housing, if they don't have homes, if they don't have shelter, if they don't have water, if they don't have sanitation, how do we expect them to get to a job interview and be hired? We really are underestimating the extent to which we have a housing crisis and the, the lack of work that's been done to have a comprehensive social housing plan. People's dignity is probably more affected by where they live and how they live than whether or not they have access to a job. I know that there's a common narrative that jobs are the pipeline to dignity, but I want to say that even if you don't have a job, you deserve dignity, and that dignity means that you deserve proper sanitation, proper housing, proper ways in order to live your life in a way that is dignified and decent. And I think we have to have a very strong conversation about why housing is not on the ballot enough. We talk about land in this country, but we haven't had a conversation about land for housing when we actually have a huge housing crisis. So the other issue that I'm gonna be looking for on the ballot is 
the economy and jobs. Many um, political parties have been talking about their jobs plan, and the ANC uses the same language, the jobs plan. What is their plan to create or enable jobs in our economy, depending on which side of the divide you are about government's role? What's interesting for me, especially with um, the ANC, is that the ANC's got a reliance on what they call job opportunities as the way to speak about the numbers that they're going to be chasing. So in an economy where 4.6 million young people are unemployed, this is just people between the ages of 15 and 34. And you may say to me, 15 is too young to be working. I say to you that half of the people who start grade one don't end, end in matric. So we have a huge dropout rate and those people need to go somewhere. 16 year olds who are dropping out of grade 10 and grade nine need to be able to be absorbed somewhere into the economy, especially because the working age does, does start at 16 in this country. But be that as it may, 4.6 million young people alone are unemployed in South Africa. So you need to be able to present a set of solutions that help us know that those young people will in some way be brought into the system. Now, when we do the EFF, there are a lot of interesting conversations we're gonna have about those proposals. But the two big differences and similarities around um, the jobs plan for the ANC and the DA are this. One is the reliance on government as an employer. So the first big commitment that the ANC makes is to 2.2 million job opportunities. The bulk of those job opportunities are actually sitting within um, the public employment schemes. So the expanded public works program, the community public works program, and more recently, the president's presidential youth employment um, initiatives, especially the education program and the teacher assistance program. What they mean by job opportunities is that they're not committing to people having sustainable jobs, contracts, and kind of long-term um, employment. These are short-term opportunities. They're more internships than they are jobs. What's weird about you know, talking about job opportunities with their chests, but ignoring the question of full employment or substantive employment, is that they don't explain why a job opportunity will result in a job or may even result in a job. There's a celebration of an opportunity to work without thinking about the long-term plan to ensure that that employment is, is real. Because that 2.2 million, in every, in every context that you can think about, could actually be 500,000 people taking up the same opportunities four times in the next five years. It literally can be a smaller number of people that actually get those opportunities. So we have, you have 2.2 million opportunities, but that does not necessarily mean 2.2 million people are getting opportunities. It means that the same people after one year of this program could go into another program like that and another program like that. It just doesn't solve the unemployment crisis. The DA has a similar problem. Its um, response to this is a bit more of a systemic one because it's a reliance on the private sector. So it's not just relying on, on the government. But its private sector role is let's make work um, regulations as flexible as possible for employers. Let's give employers as few things that, that they need to do in order to ensure somebody can come and work for them so that they get more people through the door. But what does that actually mean? One of the things the ANC commits to and has shown a commitment to is the minimum wage. The DA's call for flexibility could scrap the minimum wage in many instances and say that an employer in order to bring in a young person can say the 3,500 or so that's minimum wage or 4,000 I think it is now, doesn't have to apply here. And so you can hire this person for a thousand rand and it still be legal employment. That doesn't help the young people of this country be fully employed in a way that's substantive. So it raises our employment numbers, but it doesn't guarantee that that employment actually changes the lives of people. People are not meant to work to just work. They are meant to work to be able to live, work to be able to eat, work to be able to go out and be productive in other ways in society, contribute to society. If we have just a whole lot of flexible labor, we have to think about the implications of that, the ways in which it can benefit the employer to have more people working there 
but not necessarily the employed. So both of these are uh, different strategies, but I think both of them don't go far enough to ask how do we get to sustainable employment in the long run. The ANC and the DA also speak about different industries or different uh, macro policies. The ANC is a lot more specific about the kinds of industries that it wants to look at. So it speaks a lot about financialization of the economy and the financial sector. It speaks about manufacturing. So it's speaking about industries that it wants to revive or expand. Um, the DA doesn't get into as much detail about which industries it will rely on to ensure um, the expansion of the economy and that more people get to participate. What is important for both of them, in terms of my view, is both of them focus way too much on big industries, big corporates, and the formal sector. Whereas what we've seen, again, across the continent of Africa, which has much lower rates of unemployment, even in countries that are doing financially worse than us in terms of how much money is available. Small and micro businesses give people much more um, options in terms of economic participation and give us more options even for employment of people in small and micro enterprises. Both of these manifestos fall short, I think, in really coming up with innovative and new plans for small and micro businesses. They really just are talking at a very surface level about the fact that these must be supported. But how, to what end, what the numbers are, and what the outcomes are they're looking for, I think they fall short. The last thing I wanna talk about in terms of the ANC versus the DA um, that I care about in terms of their manifestos, the issues that are on the ballot for me, is an issue I'm calling innovating democracy. So if you've watched this channel before, you know that I'm a strong advocate that democracy needs to be better. We need more democracy, but we mustn't just have the status quo. We must change democracy to fit our needs as a country. And so in these two uh, manifestos, they treat this very differently, and I think it's in important ways. The ANC, for the first time in you know, the times that I've seen the elections I remember, actually has a priority called defending democracy. And what's in that priority for me is on one hand heartening, but on the other hand, highly concerning. So there is a focus on making sure the governance works. Very superficially, but yes. But there's also a celebration of the fact that the institutions of governance and the institutions of democracy work. The judiciary, the court system, um, that we have the chapter nine institutions and that we have elections that are credible and defending that and making sure that that, you know, holds. But what's also in that section um, is this idea of crime um, and policing, which I found as a strange place to put that particular section. It says something about the idea that the police and increasing the number of police, by a very small margin, by the way, it's only 10,000 new police in the next five years, which is a bit weird. But to put that in section in the defense of democracy alongside um, beefing up the military speaks to the idea of policing us in order to defend democracy. And I think we need to think about what that means, why we would put policing and crime in the defense of democracy. Some may say, well, if we have a safer country, it would be more democratic. I don't know. I need to be convinced about what those arguments are. But I think more importantly, strengthening our democracy has got a lot more to do with accountability and leadership. And I think the DA does a good job of focusing in on that. I mean, their, their talks about policing and crime are also quite um, interesting. Um, in both of those cases, when it comes to policing and crime, um, crime, the answer for both parties is the police. But when it comes to the broader dem democratic project, I think the DA is a lot more specific about the fact that the state needs to be fixed and that you need good people in the state in order to get the state to function. I think the ANC, because it is in governance so many places, would be found to be quite hypocritical if, if it said the things that the DA is saying about making sure that things are better or people who are in the state are based on merit and that you have the best possible people. Um, President Ramaphosa, when he spoke at the ANC's rally, actually made a big deal of the fact that the ANC is doing interviews this year, which is traditionally a DA thing, 
to come up with his lists. Um, and so it, he, he intimated it more than what it is in the document, that they will think about and make sure that the quality of people that go into leadership um, is good. Um, the DA will be criticized because it says no CADA deployment. I sometimes think that we overthink that, that statement around CADA deployment because what the DA's focus is when it comes to CADA deployment is about the bureaucrats, not about the politicians and people in political office. But either way, on both sides, there is an admission that we need a strong state, we need strong institutions, and we need good leaders. And that's the last thing I'm going to say about manifestos today. It's really important that you have good ideas, but those manifestos and those good ideas are going to mean nothing if you don't have good leaders, competent leaders, leaders that are not corrupt, leaders that are ethical, and leaders that we can hold accountable. I'm sad that in both of these manifestos, the ANCs and the DAs, they do not address the question of electoral reform and how it is that they envision selecting leaders, having those leaders elected, and how we as the voter can hold those leaders more accountable. That's actually an electoral reform issue, which, we, which we've spoken about before. But I think there must be a larger and more firm commitment to what happens if leaders don't perform, if elected officials don't perform, if representatives don't perform. Because at the end of the day, if we are only able to hire and fire every five years, we have too much room for people just to wait it out while they do bad things. And we as the people can't do anything about it. So I hope that we go into this election thinking about these issues. I didn't cover everything that's in the manifestos, because again, I say that we cover manifestos based on what we want, not what they say we should want. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's spread the fire and let's keep this conversation going until the 29th of May.